Hi, everyone. I'm Mike Grzuk, and I'm excited to be joined by Diana Seiler and Robert Bullock today. We're going to do the KWB 2024 Economic Outlook for uh, basically July through the rest of the year. So apologies. We uh, had a wonderful recording with Mike Aroni a couple of weeks ago. Zoom decided to delete the audio. So we're going to share our thoughts and basically record uh, that thought for today. So let's jump in. Let's start with a little look at what we're seeing with the economy. So one of the things, Diana and Robert, that I've been watching pretty closely, it's a rule that the that the uh, Fed actually manages. It's something that they call the SOM rule. Basically, what it's looking at is the last 12 months of unemployment data, and it's trying to see what's what's the pace, what's the trajectory? Is it increasing? Is it decreasing? What's happening? And so the, the rule basically says we look over the last 12 months, and if over a, a three month period, we increase by half a percent or more, likely the economy is headed for a recession. And so this is something that's pretty close to triggering. I mean, we're at 0.43 on that indicator. And so if we continue to get rising unemployment, it's possible that uh, we could be headed for a recession. So something that, that again, I, I kind of watch closely and uh, I'm just kind of interested in what some of your guys' thoughts are on what's happening with the song rule. Yeah, Mike, so with unemployment, I mean, we're definitely paying attention to that. The Fed's really looking into that, but we're looking for more widespread layoffs, right? So, you know, a lot of times we'll see headline news of, you know, this tech company or that tech company is laying off, you know, 10,000 or however many workers, but, you know, the tech sector is such a small portion. So we're, we would be looking for more widespread layoffs and, you know, it's just, we're not seeing that unemployment rate is is very low, like you said, but you know it could creep up pretty fast. But you know it's just one of those indicators that we're definitely looking at, but seems okay so far. Yeah, I, wouldn't you agree that the unemployment rate is a lagging indicator anyway? I mean, we could be in a recession by the time that index actually indicates that we're in a recession. Yeah, I mean that's that's why the the sum rule is kind of an interesting one because it's it's trying to get ahead of it it's trying to to take that lagging indicator and say hey well you know if the pace is accelerating you know typically unemployment is a cascading effect you know sometimes a company is going to lay off people which means that another company that supports that company has to lay off people and so it's one of those things where it's not uh, an issue until suddenly it is so I think that the I think the important thing to to take away from what we're seeing with Psalm Rule is it's it's an important indicator, but it's kind of like the yield curve. You know, the yield curve inversion is something that that typically follow is followed by a recession. But not every time that we get an inverted yield curve do we have a recession. And I kind of think it's it's likely the similar case where if this triggers, if we get that half a percent increase and we're showing the trajectory rise. It doesn't necessarily mean, oh, hey, we're guaranteed to be in a recession. It's just one of those things that historically has preceded recession. So I, I find when when you really dig into the data, we kind of have to look at, well, who's applying for unemployment? You know, is this new workers? Is this people who had an existing job? And so we can look at a metric that we call insured versus uninsured unemployment. And what I'm seeing is the insured unemployment filings. So people who already had a job had been pay paying into the unemployment bucket, you know, they're the people who aren't tending to to file for unemployment. So in other words, those aren't the people who are losing their jobs. I think that it's a little bit more related to, you know, new people entering the workforce, getting out of college, immigration, things like that. So it is something that we pay close attention to, but you know, historic fact, usually when you when you have 6% or more unemployment, that's when the economy is in a recession. And right now we went from 3.7 to 4.1. So even though things are rising, you know, and it's something that, that we're just watching closely, it's not just in your face triggering, hey, you know, be concerned. So I, I feel like that's still a positive at this point. Absolutely. And then, you know, the other thing we have to look at, and this kind of we're segueing into our next topic is the consumer. So what is going on with everyone? So we know first point, unemployment, the labor market is pretty healthy from what we discussed. So 
you know, transitioning into the consumer, you know, our economy is made up mostly of what the consumer is doing. So about 70% of our growth is based off of what the consumer is doing. And so we kind of wanted to touch on that as far as the health of the consumer and, and what we're seeing out there. And so this first chart that we have about disposable income, it looks like it's it's outpaced inflation even at its peak and as it continues to rise you know, over time. So the dark green line that shows the disposable personal income, the lighter color green is employee compensation, and then you have inflation there in the gray line. And so you can see that you know, during the pandemic, the disposable income went really high. That's because we didn't have, you know, we're in the pandemic, we didn't have much to do. But, you know, over time, we can still see that as inflation has creeped up, that we've we've had widespread wage growth. You know, there's disposable income just seems to be higher than inflation. It's outpacing it. So what that really boils down to is that the consumer seems to be in pretty decent health. And that's what Mike Aroni alluded to in our conversation with him as well, that he felt pretty good about the consumer. We did see in recent reports that spending has calmed down a little bit. I think people are being really selective on what they're spending their money on. And that's across all different age uh, age ranges, you know, so, but we're seeing that people are still spending, they're still going out, having a good time. Um, there are some things, obviously inflation is really, uh, is really kind of dampen that spending, but what we might see as things continue at that chart right now, there's going to be, um, you know, more of a disparity because as inflation comes down, you know, disposable income is going to go up. And so, you know, and that's kind of what I think the Fed is battling right now. You know, they don't want to, they don't want our lower rates too soon because maybe that will spur inflation again. People start spending, you know, so it's kind of a fine line. Um, what are your thoughts? Any, have you heard anything or seen anything as far as consumer spending that you guys have have noticed? Yeah, I think I think you nailed it when you said that it's getting selective. You know, we had earnings come out from McDonald's, for example, and what what we're starting to see is just the consumer is saying, you know, at, at a certain price point, it's not worth it buying you know a eight, nine, ten dollar burger. And so the consumer is definitely getting more selective with with where their spending is. But I think just in general, you know, the chart that that you had is is fantastic, and it just shows, you know, as long as as long as there's that disparity between the inflation rate and then people's employment income, they're going to continue to spend. And so that's the thing that, that we tend to watch is, you know, is there that free cash flow for a household, that disposable income? And as long as there is, you know, economy is likely going to continue on. My thought is, uh, it sort of goes back to Mike's comment, as long as the uh, individual has a job, Americans are good at spending. And as long as Americans are spending, it's a pretty healthy economy, even though it may feel uh, like it's getting tight. But if you got a job and if 70% of the Americans are spending, pretty decent economy, at least at this point. Absolutely. And I feel like, you know, if when the Fed lowers rates, that should probably spur some growth as well, because I think it seems like a lot of people are sitting on the sidelines because maybe they don't want to take a loan out at these high interest rates. As long as the consumer is spending, as I mentioned earlier, then I think it's pretty good for corporate earnings. Corporations are in pretty good financial shape. They sort of came out of the pandemic uh, and did what uh, the rest of us did when we refinanced our mortgages to take advantage of the low rates. Corporations did did the same thing. And so uh, they refinanced uh, their debt to get lower rates. Uh, uh, the economy continues to grow just under 3% which is pretty amazing because interest rates in early 2022 or a 10-year treasury was at one and a half. Currently, it's around four and a half. But in spite of all that, uh, the economy continues to do quite well. Uh, this chart shows um, companies are beginning to report, S&P 500 companies are beginning to report second quarter uh, numbers. Uh, and if you look at the far left, revenue growth uh, so far is up about four and a half percent. This is the 270 companies out of 500, so a little bit less than half of the companies reporting the second quarter uh, numbers. 59%, uh, almost 60% of the companies are beating their revenue estimates. 
Uh, 78% of the companies uh, are actually beating their earnings. And so far this year, uh, earnings are up about 10.5%. Um, analysts are actually expecting for this year, uh, earnings to be up about 11%, uh, about 14% next year, which is really intriguing because analysts are actually expecting for next year, small company earnings to be up almost 18, 19%. So corporations are doing pretty well. Uh, to say the least. Um, and lastly, uh, uh, late last week on Wednesday, I think we got a report called the PMI, Purchasing Managers Index. Uh, and any number 50 and higher indicates the economy is growing. It came in at 55, which is the fastest growth we've seen in almost 27 months. And so pretty good economy. Yeah, I was just I was kind of doing the math because when you look at the corporate earnings, I mean, we we look at that per, that forward earnings estimate so, you know, the chart was showing 258. We multiplied that by an earnings multiple, essentially, and that gets us uh, estimated price for stocks. So that puts the S&P right at around 5,400, which is, you know, right, right around where we are today. So, you know, in other words, it looks like corporate earnings are going to remain strong, and that's justifying the, the stock prices that we're seeing today. We'd like to, to kind of see that connection. I would agree. And frankly, if interest rates go down, you may see that uh, that number expand, uh, which would relate to a higher right. Uh, S&P. Right. All right. That seems to be consensus, I think, at this time. Absolutely. And then just to kind of summarize what we went over the next slide, these are some of the things that we are looking at, you know, as a reminder. So, when we think about recession, these are the few things that we just want to pay attention to. So inflation, what's happening with inflation, it seems to be on a downward trajectory. So that's good. And then inflation obviously has a direct impact on what the Fed decides to do. So interest rates, you know, Mike Aroni alluded to in the webinar that he thinks one of the biggest risks for recession is that the Fed waits too long to reduce rates. And so you know, we'll see what's happening. Actually, you know, they're in a they're in a meeting, you know, the week of the 30th, the 29th or 30th and 31st. Yeah, tomorrow. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, they'll announce. But uh, but he thought that that was the biggest risk to recession. And then, you know, corporate earnings, Bobby just talked about that. We watch those regularly, but they seem to be in an upward trajectory. So that's good. But that's something we watch as well. Slowing consumer spending just because consumers obviously have a huge impact on growth. And then Mike, you were talking about employment and what's going on there. But, you know, unfortunately, if, if we start seeing those widespread layoffs, it might be too late, but it's definitely something that we're paying attention to. Right. So uh, let's go to the next slide, Bella. I think what's what's fun is when you summarize it all, you know, you put it all together. Uh, this gives us an indication of are things improving? Are they getting worse? You know, what's kind of happening? So this is actually put together by Franklin Investments. And what I like is it kind of shows the growth. I mean, really the path that we've had almost over the last year. And so, you know, we went from a, a overall negative recession signal. I mean, I remember in 2023, like just, just at the start of the year, 90% of analysts were predicting that we're going to be in a recession. And then it ended up being a pretty phenomenal year. So the consumer was more resilient than expected. Companies did a better job of cutting expenses and you know being nimble better than expected. And that's actually improved the overall situation that we're in today. So when we look at recession indicators as a whole, very few are kind of flashing that that warning signal. And so, you know, just it's it's stuff like sentiment, you know, how people are feeling, and then the yield curve, which has been negative now for almost a, a three, four year period. But everything else is actually looking okay. And so I think that there's pretty, pretty low risk of recession at the moment, you know, barring the Fed making a, a pivot mistake or something like that. Yeah, and I would agree. I don't know how you have a recession when you've got 4% unemployment rate. Right. Uh, yeah. So good. It's good, good news all around, frankly. Yeah. So Diana, you want to just kick us off with a, a quick summary of what our thoughts are in the economy? Yes. Yeah, so we, you know, just discussing all those indicators at, at that last chart just showed that things are actually improving since December. So, you know, we just really think that it's very highly unlikely that we would have a recession in the next six to 12 months, that we're going to continue to monitor those indicators. 
Um, but we feel pretty optimistic over the next six to 12 months. And so I think right now, what everyone's really laser focused on is is interest rates. And so uh, we kind of want to dive into that topic and and see where we're headed, Bob. Wonderful. Thanks. Uh, I'll take the next hour and a half. That'd be great. I'll talk about interest rates. <laughs> uh, let's go to the next slide. It really is dependent upon what the Fed decides today. Uh, we know they're awfully darn close. We know it's a process that they've been going through for the last two and a half years. Of uh, uh, In early 22, the Fed looked at the economy and said, wow, really good U.S. economy, uh, really low on a plumber rate in early 2022, but where the Fed was also looking at a 9% inflation rate. Uh, the Federal Reserve wants prices to go up about 2% a year, not 9% a year. So the Fed began a laborious process of trying to slow the economy down in order to get inflation down to something more acceptable by beginning the process of slowly raising interest rates. And so uh, here we are two and a half years later, uh, and the Fed is now in a pretty good position. We'll see what decision they make today of, uh, of beginning the process of maybe lowering interest rates. And there's some good reasons. The next chart actually is one of the good indicators as to why the Fed may consider beginning the lower interest rates. Inflation indicated here is now under 3%. Um, uh, we've seen, as Mike had alluded earlier, unemployment has gone from the mid 3.5, 3.7 to 4.1. Uh, we've got rents, which is one of the large components of CPI inflation, actually not going up as fast as it used to be. Uh, and uh, uh, and so all that's good news for the Fed. And so we'll see once again what decision the Fed makes. But I always remind myself, whatever the when the Fed is dealing with interest rates, the Fed is actually dealing with uh, short-term interest rates. And those short-term interest rates relate to things like personal loans and credit cards and the interest that you can get on your six-month CD, stuff like that. It really has nothing to do with long-term interest rates. And that really relates to mortgages. <laughs> And so uh, one of the worries I have, and let's bring up the next chart just to give an opportunity for people to look at it. Um, what really makes long-term interest rates go up and down is the amount of borrowing that the U.S. government is doing. Uh, one of the statistics that I saw the other day is the just amount of debt that the U.S. government has. Under President Bush, the second President Bush, the U.S. owed uh, a total of $5 trillion to the world. 10 years later under Obama, it had grown to $10 trillion. Here it is under Biden, uh, it's at $35 trillion. Imagine the amount of interest that we have to pay, and that's what this first chart shows uh, on the left, is the interest that the U.S. government is going to pay is equal to half the cost of running Social Security. And if the U.S. government continues to borrow $200 billion extra a, uh, a month just to make up for the deficit, 10 years from now, interest is expected to not only be half of Social Security, but it's actually going to be more than the defense of the United States. And that interest, that money could have been used to rebuild the bridges for uh, spending on education. But no, it's just going to be used just to pay the interest on the enormous amount of debt. And so um, I relate it to, there's something called the net investment position to GDP. It's the amount of all the goods and services created in one year in the United States as to how many uh, months it would take to pay off that debt. Uh, it's currently at nine months worth of a year's activity to pay off the debt. 10 years ago, mm -hmm. it only took four months to pay off the debt. And 30 years ago, it took a month of all that activity to pay off the debt. And so it's been a 30-year spending binge by the U.S. government, and it really doesn't matter which political party. It's been both political parties uh, that are responsible for it. And so my thought is, yeah, the Fed may be cutting short-term rates, but my suspicion is these long-term rates are going to be higher or longer, uh, and uh, we'll see exactly what the Fed does today when it comes to short term rights. Right. I think I think I one, of, thoughts. one of the one of those risks is, you know, they, they cut short term rates, but if if there's still all the obligations out there, 
it's the the lenders that demand a higher rate and that's what what ends up keeping it higher for longer on the the long end of the spectrum i mean that that would give us a normalized yield curve i mean that's that's typical that the longer term rates are going to be uh higher than shorter term but uh yeah i think that it runs into a situation where people just they won't lend money to the us if there's too much debt because it's perceived as a risk so investors demand a higher interest rate, and that's what what's likely to to keep the long end of the curve higher. Yeah, and, and my thoughts. I mean, how many times have we heard comments from clients saying, uh, "Is the amount of debt in the U.S. a problem?" Uh, it isn't a problem until we wake up one morning that it is. So at some point it will be, uh, but I doubt it's going to be an issue over the next six months. Right. And this is the first time in thirty five years that interest on our debt has gone up. And so it's just, you know, there has to be, something's got to give, you know, I just, there's a lot of comments out there about, you know, to continue the spending, the government spending, like we are, it's just irresponsible. And I think Mike Aroni uh, alluded to that as well, just that, you know, something has to give. And, you know, depending on, we're going to get into the election here in a minute, but depending on, you know, who gets in, you know, there's been discussion of taxes going up to to help compensate for that. And so if if tax rates don't go up, you know, who's going to pay for it? That's the ultimate question. And like everyone asks that, who's going to pay for it? And so, you know, it'll be really interesting. It's you know, we don't talk about it frequently. A lot of politicians don't want to talk about the debt. And so but it is very important and it's concerning. And so we'll just have to see what they what they end, end up doing. So let's touch on, you had mentioned the the uh, uh, politics and the election. Uh, I, I think you've got some comments regarding uh, probably the most frequently asked question that we get from clients these days. Yes, it, it seems almost daily. Uh, so on the next slide, just a few touch points. So, you know, elections, they're always emotional. Every year, every election, it's always, em- it's always emotional. You know, um, I think more so lately, it, it's been very triggering for people. And so what we try to remind everybody to do is just try to take the emotions out of it. You know, focus on the election or politics separately from your finances or your portfolio. Try to stay objective. You know, we know the political environment has changed, you know, with the assassin, assassination attempt and, you know, Biden dropping out of the race. There's been a lot of things going on, but, you know, we just feel that and it's proven and we just want to remind everybody just to try to stay objective we are happy to hold your hand through the whole thing but you know you should just follow your plan that we've built for you you know continue to stay diversified you know you cannot time these things the market goes up no matter who's in you know whatever political party the market continues to go up and so you know it's just stay objective uh and the other thing that i alluded to a second ago is that You know, if Trump is elected, there is the potential that maybe the tax code is extended. And so, you know, that might have an implication on the debt as well. You know, we'll just have to see what goes on there. So that's something that we're very closely watching. So the current tax law is supposed to sunset at the end of next year. So we should get some sort of indication next year what's going on there. And then you know, what we have found over history is that the market tends to like a gridlock situation. That's where you have one political party, maybe in the White House and then the other in Congress. And there's maybe not a lot that gets done. The market really likes to have the freedom to go about business. You know, so the market tends to do pretty well in a gridlock situation. Now, if legislation does get pushed forward in a gridlock situation, then that's a good thing. That means it's bipartisan. That's what we all want. Uh, we want everyone to work together, you know, so that's that's a good thing. But um, we're just waiting to see what happens in November, but it really shouldn't impact your portfolio or anything like that. Any thoughts? Yeah, I, my thought is if if, uh, if the client is getting overwhelmed by what's going on uh, and you want to be able to sleep at night, one of the suggestions I tell people is don't listen to the news. Uh, <laughs> don't read the newspaper. Believe it or not, life's going to go on uh, regardless of what's going on in Washington. So uh, sometimes it's helpful just to uh, avoid the situation. I, I personally, I like to remind people markets are, you know, people get so focused on who's in office and this and that. And 
we're buying companies, you know, we're investing in companies. And frankly, it's like Microsoft doesn't stop putting out office subscriptions and selling windows because, you know, this person wins office or that person does. So companies are inherently trying to grow profits. They're trying to fill a need for people and that's what they do. And so they, they are made to withstand any kind of political environment. And so I think that the president often gets more credit than is due on what's happening economically. So just as a reminder, we're investing in companies and those companies are going to try to grow and expand regardless of who's president. Yeah. Absolutely. And if you want to learn more about it, our third quarter newsletter is dedicated to the election. So there's some neat charts in there and Steve uh, shares his his thoughts and, and our forecasting on, you know, the economy and potential effects of, of, you know, one party over the other. And so, you know, check that out if you have further questions on the election, but otherwise just like Tom said, maybe don't watch the news, just, you know, hibernate until, you know, late November or whatever it takes to get you through this, talk to us, but just try to take the emotions out of it and, and stay objective. And, you know, I alluded to diversification, you know, it's very important to remain diversified. Um, and so that's kind of the next topic we want to get into is, is the importance of that. Well, you well, mean, you mean Mike, should I have something other than just the magnificent seven? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, they've, they've been pretty magnificent, but uh, I think it's, it's something to keep in mind that there's never one thing that just always consistently does well all of the time. And so I love this quote by by Ben Carlson, who is an analyst that, that we like to listen to quite often. He says, diversification is about accepting good enough while missing out on great, but avoiding terrible. So sometimes, you know, Robert, like what you're just joking about, it's okay to miss out on just this massive run that something like NVIDIA is doing because everything has its come to Jesus moment. There's always a day of reckoning where people say, okay, you know, this has gone a little bit too far, a little bit too fast. And there's always some kind of reset. And so let's uh, let's go to to the next chart because I feel like people have short-term memories, right? I mean, that's something that, that we've just always seen as investors. And so one of the things that we've been questioned on quite, quite a bit is, hey, how come, you know, I just don't take my portfolio and put it all in the S&P 500 and, you know, Done. Simple. Easy. I think it's it's because there's periods of time where there's underperformance in the things that have historically have done well. And the whole point of diversification is you want to, if you're taking income from a portfolio, be able to take that income from something that isn't going down in price. And so we, we have that short-term memory effect of forgetting what happened in 99, 2000 during that initial tech crash with the internet. You know, there was there was almost a 10-year period, we call it the last decade, where the S&P 500 didn't do anything. You actually lost money and were better off just being in cash at that point. And so we want to make sure that we're diversified in lots of different markets, whether it's bonds, whether it's international stocks, small companies. And so what, what I like about this chart is it's basically showing if we go back and we look at somebody who started with a million dollars, they invested their portfolio, they were taking income, you know, basically between uh, 2020 or 2000 and uh, today, you know, what, what happened over time? And this is showing if they just had their money invested in, in cash, you know, that million dollar portfolio dropped to, to 200,000. But if you put that into just a balanced fund, you know, Vanguard, it was uh, just in something that was 60, 40, 60% bonds, 40 or 60% stocks, 40% bonds you ended up basically maintaining your value. You didn't lose any money and yet you you got your uh, 5% income stream. And then if you took something and you globally diversified it. So now instead of just being focused on US markets, you were globally diversified. You know, we ended up with with almost twice the, the wealth. And lots of that happened early. You know, it happened during that period of time between 2000 and uh, really 2012. So there's periods of outperformance internationally with small companies, all those things. And that's why it's important for people to still own them in their portfolio. We don't know when it's gonna be an outperformance year in those asset classes. So you want a small piece invested during all markets. And Mike, aren't we starting to see a change uh, outperformance in some of these different asset classes? I mean, now that we're transitioning 
uh, or we will soon transition into a lower interest rate environment, we're seeing that certain asset classes are starting to outperform. And so it's very interesting to see. And, and that's quite frankly, that's what we're doing in the portfolios, you know, behind the scenes, what we're doing for clients, talking to LPL research or, you know, whoever it is, whatever institution that, that we're collaborating with, you know, we're playing offense and defense on both stock stocks and bonds. And so, right. you know, it's, it's interesting how um, we're starting to see massive outperformance in certain different asset classes. What do you, what's your take on that? Right. I mean, it's definitely starting to happen. And so what I would say is when you look at the the economic cycle, I, I personally feel like, you know, 2022 was the start of a new cycle. And usually you'll, you'll see small companies outperform coming off of a recession or coming off of a, a slow cycle. And it's normal for larger companies to outperform at this point. And when you have high interest rates, you know, typically the companies, the largest ones are going to have the cheapest borrowing costs. And so that alone has caused uh, a reason for outperformance in larger companies. But it is shifting. You know, so when we look at what's kind of happening right now, we are dealing with hopefully a lower lower interest rate environment going forward. You know, I do think that the Fed is going to do some rate cuts soon. And what that's doing is it's causing people to, to shift their money around and start to go to these other asset classes that haven't performed as well. So let's uh, let's jump to the chart, Bella. Uh, I think that that it, this is going to kind of show that outperformance. So this is this is really interesting to me because I I took this snippet uh, bottom of the chart there shows the date, so June twenty seventh of this year. And what this is showing is the major asset classes and you know who is doing the best. And so we can see the Nasdaq over a three year period returned forty one percent. The S and P was below that. 34%. So these are, you know, those largest companies held in the, the biggest portion of somebody's uh, portfolio. But you look at international and small companies, and I'd have to say this is probably one of the longest periods of small company underperformance that we've seen. So over a three-year period, investors have actually lost money in small caps. So let's go to the next chart, because this is showing that same exact chart, but as of Friday. Look at what happened just within I, I want to say this happened within a five-day window, and so if you recall what happened, we got a we got an inflation read that said, "Oh, you know, it looks like inflation is cooling even more." And so what that told the market is, "Hey, it's really, really likely that the Fed is going to start to lower interest rates." And almost immediately, investors started shifting their portfolios. So we saw quite a big de decline in the the Nasdaq. So we went from forty-one percent to only up twenty-seven. So we gave back a lot of return on those biggest companies like. Nvidia, Google, you know, Microsoft, things like that. And we saw a lot of money rotate into small companies. So the the bottom line here is things can change very quickly. And so you need to stay positioned at all times to take advantage of that. And so just because something uh, may not have performed well over the last three years doesn't mean that over the next three, it's not. So diversification is very important. It helps get investors through extended periods of time of underperformance in the major indexes, you like during 99 and 2000, and it helps get you your income because we have things to to sell that hopefully are going up in value when those other indexes might be going through a rough period of time. And trying to time it is virtually impossible. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, again, that, that change with small companies, it was like five trading days. So, you know, who's who's going to be able to say, oh, that's a trend. So very, very quick movement in a very short period of time, a 13% move on the upside. That's pretty incredible. That was huge. And then, you know, you saw international do well. And, you know, it's been a long time. International, It's been <laughs> really hard to be in the international space, especially right. over the last, you know, 10, 15 years. We're actually in the longest period of, in history where U.S. has outperformed international. And, um, you know, some of the the reasons might be just that we were so quick to to stimulate our economy after the pandemic and you know foreign countries were not and so they may just be lagging a little bit so it'll be really interesting to see are we transitioning into you know a period of time where where foreign stocks do well you know we'll see but uh the other thing that we're seeing is greater breadth. Mike, could you just, I know you talked about this in your diversification webinar some time ago, but could you just explain what breadth is? And we are starting to see, um, you know, more expense, more expansion there. Could you just elaborate a little bit? 
Yeah. So when you when you look at where the performance has really been, I mean, we we say the Mag Seven. I mean, that's that's basically saying when you look at the whole S and P five hundred, there's five hundred companies. Seven of them have did, been doing extremely well, and most other companies have been doing either okay or actually haven't had positive returns for a two to three year period. So that's starting to change. And so when we talk about breadth, it's it's saying that that shift is widening. More companies are starting to be profitable and making new highs. And that just means that, you know, the growth isn't as concentrated as it previously was. You know, the good news is lots of people tend to be afraid that, oh, if all the growth is concentrated, if something happens with those companies, we get a market crash. But what normally happens is when we have outperformance in a concentrated few, the rest of the market tends to catch up when we start to have some positive catalyst. And again, that positive catalyst that we're thinking is going to be the Fed lowering interest rates. So as that happens, people are likely going to take their profits from the, the companies that have appreciated really well, shift money into the companies that you know have had a rougher go, and that starts to widen breadth of the market. And, and again, we like that because it it shows that growth is on track. It shows that more companies are are making new highs and doing the right things. And that that's the tide that lifts all boats. And we're already starting to see that, which is a good sign. Right. Absolutely. Good. So we want to end. Is there any other comments on diversification? I think we wanted to just summarize everything we've been discussing on the next slide. So as I mentioned earlier, you know, recession unlikely in the next six to 12 months, you know, all of the talking points we discussed, consumer spending, low unemployment, you know, it looks, looks pretty good. And then Robert, you got into. Yeah. I, 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 uh, my, my two cents is the Fed is likely to lower rates uh, soon, if not July, maybe September, or they could wait until maybe after the election. But uh, I think the chance of the Fed beginning the process of lowering rates and make sure that we don't go into a recession is is pretty close. Uh, and Mike, on the on the portfolio, yeah, I think with the portfolio, the the important thing to keep in mind is we're going to remain nimble. We're constantly looking at what's happening with economic data, with market data, with political data. We just want to make sure that you know we're positioned well, regardless of what's happening with, with the markets, with the economy. So we continue to stay diversified. And as we continue to see our performance and other things, we're likely going to make small shifts to take advantage of that within portfolios. And with that, thank you everyone for joining. All right. Great job, Diana, Robert. Appreciate thank you guys' you. this time.